Uh, so welcome back everyone. Thanks for the introduction. Hi, uh, for those I haven't met, my name is Kira McGuire and I'm a PhD student at, uh, at DIAS with uh, many of those on the call here. So before we kind of delve in to working with the radio data, we thought it'd be useful to have a bit of an introduction reminding us of why it's important that we use multiple different instruments, um, looking at a variety of different uh, frequencies um, but also to kind of give you an insight into what the instruments themselves look like, because sometimes it can be a, a bit of a, a distant kind of concept. Um, so to kind of refresh and to touch back on many of the topics that were explored yesterday and this morning, when looking at in, in the, in the solar con context, um, some of these transi events, as you can see from the schematic here, depicting um, a solar flare, a kind of traditional CME from the expulsion of material outwards, there's a variety of different complex processes that are going on that can often result in radio waves. So whether that's from a coronal shock front, as Diana spoke about earlier, CNR type twos, or electrons say being accelerated along open magnetic field lines where we see our type threes. A multitude of different uh, processes emit radio waves. And we know they emit uh, via the plasma emission, which Owen spoke about. And it's such a, a useful mechanism because from the relationship that the frequency that we observe, the plasma frequency, is related to the electron density. So we can tell, um, and we know that lower down in the solar corona, we have much higher densities and it drops about or almost radially as we, as we move outwards. So emission with a high frequency kind of tells us that uh, it's coming from a high density region low down in the solar corona. But in order to get from frequency to electron density, then to kind of an idea of, of the height and, the, and the, to kind of give us a, a spatial um, idea of where these sources are, you need a density model, something that Owen will touch on later. And we have here uh, in this plot of density versus height, a handful of examples of semi-empirical models. Um, examples that are some may be familiar with, the SATO, the Newkirk model. And what they aim to do is to describe the density profile um, as you move away from the sun. And they kind of, they describe usually kind of different environments. So whether that's the active sun or coronal holes or quiet sun um, environments. And what we can do by using one of these models is working back from, we look back at our equation for, for plasma emission there. We can then work out the height at which the radio emission is coming from. And as I mentioned, we say high and low, kind of in the context of, of low fire being um, termed of low emission in the, in the megahertz range. So the high frequencies come from, from lower down in the uh, solar environment, and then obviously uh, lower frequencies coming from further out. So what we will do is look at radio observations that kind of span a whole frequency range or a wide frequency range. And that involves looking at observations from ground-based instruments as well as space-based instruments. And the first ground-based instrument that you're going to be looking at is observations from an instrument called Orfe. I won't murder the French pronunciation of the whole name of it, but it is this five meter diameter antenna that you see here, located in Nancy in France, measuring uh, a frequency range in the gigahertz into uh, megahertz, so 130 to one gigahertz. And you have a nice example here of some um, observations from, the, uh, from Orfe. Uh, I think Diana might have presented this earlier, showing a nice bright type four radio emission. So that's looking down, uh, or looking at observations of radio emission really low down in the solar corona. Another instrument kind of looking a little bit further away from the solar surface is the instrument Callisto. And this, uh, we have a nice picture of a uh, Callisto instrument here on a beautiful sunny day in Ireland. Uh, this is the Callisto in Burr in County Offaly. And Callisto uh, are instruments dotted throughout um, the world. So you can see here from the map, the different locations that these clusters exist in. And they're measuring at a frequency that's a little bit lower. Um, so it's 45 to 870 megahertz, an example of which you can see here. This is some radio emission from um, observed by our cluster in, in Burr. The, another ground-based instrument uh, that has been mentioned numerous times is LOFAR. So we have the ground-based uh, or our international station in Ireland here. And also located in Burr. And these are actually some um, observations from it um, of a very complex event. So in total, it looks at 10 to 240 megahertz, but obviously here we're only looking at a, a kind of snapshot of it. And when we look at some of the core uh, observations, we can get even higher resolution 
Um, so we can zoom in on these kind of fine scale features, um, some of which Diana mentioned earlier, for example, herringbones. And then moving from ground-based instruments, I mentioned we can also look at satellites or space-based uh, radio instruments. And one in particular that you'll be looking at is the wind waves instrument. Um, so waves actually has five instruments on board, but we look at, at two of them when it comes to radio observations um, or for, for solar radio bursts, I suppose. And that's receiver one and two. And now this is looking at an even um, lower frequency in the kilohertz range um, or one to 13 megahertz. And as an example here, um, showing some, some solar radio bursts and type three radio emission there observed by the instrument. So why do we put all these together and why do we need to look at um, observations from, from many different instruments? Well, it's because it gives us the overall view of what's happening. Looking at these alone doesn't tell us the full picture. And we see an example of that here. So this is an event, uh, I think it was the 2nd of September in 2017. And it nicely pieces together observations from, so in high frequency, some, so from Orphe, so from really low down in the corona, all the way out um, to uh, much further out as taken by wind waves. And we get a nice holistic view of what is going on. So we can see some rapid type, type three emission from our low far, our type two here indicating that a shock formed, but without say having wind and waves, we wouldn't see that this type three propagated all the way out into interplanetary space. Um, so hopefully you'll take that will be your take home message from the rest of the tutorial. And I'll hand over to, I believe Shane uh, will be following this. Perfect. Thanks very much, Kira. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give you a little demo of Radio Spectra, um, which is a, a package that um, is part of the SunPy um, ecosystem, I guess, and is designed to access and plot um, a subset of um, radio observations um, in the term in terms of dynamic spectra. So I'm just going to share my screen. Share. So hopefully you're now seeing my desktop. Yes. Yep. Okay, sweet. Okay, so I'm going to start at the end. Uh, the goal is in the next 15 minutes to try and have you guys be able to produce a plot like this. So this is a combined plot uh, showing dynamic spectra from Orfe, Ecalisto, and the wind, uh, the waves instrument on the wind spacecraft. And um, so we've got space borne instruments here. We've got the, the Callisto network that uh, Kira just talked about, which is a, a network of low cost spectrometers uh, kind of around the globe, more or less. And then some some Orfe data as well. Um, but in order to get to this point, you guys need to get some new code uh, down from the Git repo. So I presume you can see my terminal here as well. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so if you can open open terminal um, where in your, your Stellar SSW uh, environment, so it should start with something like this. It won't, it won't look exactly like this, but the key thing is that it should start with Stellar SSW and then something else. And if you type in a, a git status, you might see something like this, where um, you might have some changes to this first notebook because you were working on it, on it yesterday. Um, I think the best way um, for you guys to do this is to actually just commit those changes to the repo. And um, I'll go through what you need to do to do this. And please, if something goes wrong, uh, ask in Slack uh, or just ask over the Zoom and we'll get it sorted out. Um, what you'd want to do, git add dash u and then hit return. And what that would do is basically say, I want to actually save these changes um, into the git GitHub repo. Um, and then what you can do is a, a git commit would be the next command. And, and that says, um, I actually have to, uh, I actually I want to commit these changes and then it'll bring you into a text editor where you have to put um put in basically a commit message so you could just say you know first days hands-on session um and at that stage um you should basically have a, a it status should show basically nothing so it won't have anything here it should just say on branch this uh, no changes 
Um, so hopefully we can we can all get to there. Obviously, as hey, well. Shane. Yeah. Yeah. The the reason for doing that is is that people are saving their own modifications. Is, is yes. that the reason yeah. for it? Okay. Yeah. Um, because any changes to those files there are out of sync with the with the forked repos that people have. That's exactly it. Yeah. That's yeah. Exactly it. Yeah. Um, and we also have the possibility if it does start getting awkward for people, um, we can run the notebooks from from Binder as well, uh, which uh, as a fallback we can do. But um, Um, so as a fallback, if you are having awful difficulties, again, it's much better to do it on your own computer because then you'll have the environment and you'll have the, fi the files, uh, but just in case you don't, um, you can go here and click this uh, launching binder link and that will actually uh, launch the Jupyter Notebook as Laura said yesterday and you'll have access to all, all of the tutorials and that should, should hopefully work. Um, but going back to what I was showing. Um, so if you've gotten this far, and um, so basically your, your git status should show nothing. What you then want to do is git pull origin main. And that basically will get all of the changes that were committed to the to the repo. Um, so, um, Yeah, how people are getting on with that. I'm not sure if you can see the chat, Shane Pierce said it works for him. Oh, is this the sorry, the the the, the zoom chat window? Because I can't see that, can I? I can't. Okay. All right. Uh, I guess one way you could test locally then is to check that the new files are in day two radio session, right? Yeah, that's, a, that's very good. So if if it's worked, I'm typing in Slack now instead of on my screen. Sorry, yeah, if, if it's worked, what you should, uh, if you do an LS of uh, day two radio session, um, you won't see all of these because I haven't committed them, but you should see this one called Radio Spectra Demo. Yeah, I have it here, Shane. Oh no, so I don't. I don't see that. You don't see that. No, but I didn't do. I didn't do any of the other stuff because I thought you were getting me to update all my files. I am. I am. No, that's 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 the idea. Um, okay. So I didn't understand. No, no, that's 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 fine. But yeah, it's it's just that there's changes on GitHub which people won't have because I um um. Okay. Yeah, I push it. So, okay, maybe there's two things we need to check. Um, so if you do a git remote dash v, um, like yesterday, so origin is your personal fork. So like I have my fork here. It has my GitHub username in it. Um, that's fine. And then upstream, it was, it's usually called is the master or that's the main repo. And um, people. People probably don't have upstream in there. I think we. No, have I don't. I don't see up. Uh, I only see okay. origin. Okay. So then, what people need to do is, um, uh, git remote add um, upstream. Oh, I can't type. Yeah, I had to, I had to do that originally as well to add upstream. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I, I forgot that. I'll, I'll pop this bit of a uh, bit of code into the Slack as well, just to uh, just make it easier because you should be able to copy copy and paste it literally. Mm -hmm. So I put that. I did spell upstream correctly, didn't I? Okay, and uh, once that's done, um, then I guess you need to pull our. Origin of uh, yeah, 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 that's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I'm gonna get to. So, so after you've done this, your git remote command 
should look similar to mine, except that it'll be your GitHub username in here. Everything else should be the same. And then what you, what you need to do is a git pull uh, upstream main. And that will pull the changes um, from the main repo, which is where you guys forked it from, or basically got, got your own copy. And then, as Laura said, um, if you want to see if that's worked, if you do an ls update to uh, radio session, you should see this file, radio spectra demo. That's the key one, basically, I added. So can everyone see that, I guess? Who can and can't? I have it anyway, yeah. Great. I, I don't have it. I don't have yeah. it either. I keep getting some message that something has crashed something. Something has crashed something. Maybe you could uh, paste the message into Slack. Um, or if you wanted, um, yeah, so, so P Peter, for your message, um, the quickest way to fix it, so basically what that's telling you is that you have local changes that would be overwritten by the upstream changes. And that's because I guess you were following along with the examples yesterday. So you've yeah. changed that day one solar source example. So you've got two, two options. You can do the stuff that I said up here, um, which would basically yeah, be... I actually had opened up another Jupyter notebook and I was copying and pasting from the original file into it and, and uh, you know, or writing into a, another so i haven't actually modified those files at all but uh, apparently they've been touched and so they uh, yeah they, they have it they have a they they're, they realize that they've been read from yeah and um, so in, in your case if if you just want to do a quick thing what you can do is do git stash and that will basically just temporarily save all of the changes so you get back to like a clean state and then you could do um, the git pull command again and it should work. Um, but basically, this is one of the issues with Jupyter is that as soon as you open the Jupyter notebook, it changes certain things uh, in the file. Um, and what was that other, there was another message, someone posted something, but I don't know where. Yeah, that all worked good. Okay, yeah. Okay, so is anyone else still having problems? Yeah, Shane, I just can't seem to manage this Git stuff at all. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> well, what's the what's the error message? Like, if, yeah, if, if if you do like Peter and just copy and paste the terminal and the error message, I think that's probably... Well, I've got a Git terminal here. Now, I'm working in Windows, so this is possibly different to um, what you've got. Um, I've got a git command terminal here. Yeah. Um, I've also got another terminal, a related terminal, Ming W64. Oh which yeah, yeah. Makes little sense to me. Um, pasting anything into either of these doesn't really result in anything useful. Um, so I tried to paste that command you uh, sent on the chat. And uh, I'm just gonna do it again here just to see what the error is. Bear with me a wee second. In the meantime, I posted a message that I have, but I, I think for some reason I'm in CCD solar rather than in my own. Uh, no, that's that is no, that's fine. So basically, the, the, the git pull command is working properly, but what it's saying is that it um, basically something else has opened the file and it can't write to it because it's open. Um, And yeah, I don't actually, I haven't seen anything like that ever before. Laura, have you ever seen anything like that or anyone else? Basically, uh, it, hap it happened to me once and I did probably the worst possible thing and just deleted the index.lock file. Oh yeah, I mm, yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not gonna do this. Um, do you, you could clone it again. You could clone the updated version in a new folder. Yeah, you could do that, yeah, yeah. Just to have everything clean and started from scratch. 
yeah, that's definitely an option. Or as I said, the the, the binder option is 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 one as well. Um, Shane, the, one, the error I'm getting is, and I've, I've cut and pasted with your copy and paste, but you pasted into the uh, Slack. Mm -hmm. uh, the error I get is fatal, not a Git repository, brackets, or any of the parent directories dot git. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah. Does PWD work in that term, that thing, just to print the current working directory? It's just It sounds like you're not in the Git direct, in the right directory. So that's what that means. That's yeah. telling you that you know you're not inside a Git directory, so you can't do Git commands because okay. PWD gives me yeah, something weird here. It's uh, forward slash s forward slash. Okay, so I think if you change directory into wherever you um, downloaded the, the cloned the repo originally, um, it should work. Um, Give it a try. So yeah, I mean, maybe for the moment, uh, again, you should be able to go to the binder link on the main repo and actually launch uh, the binder session and go to day two and radio spectrum demo if things aren't working and just so you can follow along. I mean, we'll keep trying to fix the problems, but um, there are people speaking after me and I don't want to take up all of all of their time uh, or any of their time. Um, so maybe I'll get started. I mean, it's a bit bigger. Is that readable for everyone? Hopefully. So, is there any way to increase your font, Shane? Even more? For the blind among us. Is that big enough? Yeah, go on. It's like huge now. <laughs> um, um, so, yeah, Radio Spectra, it's uh, a SunPy package. It basically builds on top of SunPy. And um, the idea is that. Um, I'm Shane. Sorry, I'll just jump in here. Yeah. But this is an important thing to you updated the environment file, right? So I did, they're yeah. Gonna, they're going to, need to update their environment. Yes, yes, they will. So maybe Great. we should talk about that quickly. I don't know, just before people get started. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's the command? I mean, the easiest way to be use pip install the thing, and then that would be fine. So. Right, I'll I'll, have a, I'll I'll link the uh, command the convent environment update in the chat. And okay, perfect. Yeah, sorry, I have to. I had to add basically tell it to install th th this package. Um, is that, sorry to interrupt you again, Shane. Is that because Radio Spectra was uh, in now is now in the YAML file, but it wasn't before? That's exactly why. Yeah. Yeah, because Mohammed had a question in the chat there saying module not found Radio Spectra, so that that relates to yeah, yeah. needing to update the environment. Yeah, exactly. And hopefully, Laura will be able to post a command to get that working uh, for you. Basically, you just have to install. Uh, the radio spectra package um, so yeah what what is radio spectra it basically provides provides fido clients for a number of uh, radio spectra sources at the moment um, it supports the radio solar telescope network i never remember what it's called uh, rstn eobsa which is the extended owns valley array uh, wind waves uh, which is a spacecraft stereo waves or, or s waves sometimes um parker solar probe RFS, which is the radio instrument on Parker Solar Probe and Callisto. Um, and there are some more, some more updates to this coming. Um, it provides a container. So like Laura talked about yesterday, there's containers for time series and containers for maps. We have a container for spectrograms. It's called spectrogram, very imaginatively. And you can find the docs here. Um, and so what we'll do today is cover uh, searching data. Sorry, so, Shane. Re yeah. really, really stupid question. I don't know how to open that file. How do I open it? Don't know how to open which file? Sorry. Uh, you're looking at a, 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 a Jupyter notebook. How do I open it? All right. So yeah, sorry. It, it would be the same as same as yesterday. So you just do uh, Jupyter notebook, and then that should just launch a session and open a browser for you, um, and show you basically. Yeah, Peter, you, you are writing Jupiter, the name of the note, the specific name. Yeah. Uh, just Jupiter Notebook is, it will launch it. Yeah, you, you should see something like this when it launches, uh, the screen. Yeah, that's what, that's what I was looking for. That's what I was looking for. But I need to type it in the right directory. Uh, yeah, so it should be in the root directory. So you should have, hang on, I'll just do an LS here. You should have, you know, day one solar sources you know, it should be that that directory there with those files and folders. 
and then if you do a Jupyter notebook um, in there, it should launch the environment. Um, so what was I saying? Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, we're gonna cover downloading data, loading it into a spectrum, plotting individual spectra, loading some custom data into a spectrogram, and then making uh, a combined plot. Um, so the first cell, again, it's very similar to yesterday. Just have to import some things that we're gonna use later on. Um, the two, I guess, new ones are from radio spectra import net, which basically registers the clients or lets FIDO know that there are radio clients in there. And then this spectrogram object, uh, which is in spectrogram two, because uh, basically there's an old one and we have to remove it. Um, so a good question is, what can you search for? The same as um, yesterday, if you just print FIDO, it'll give you a list of clients. And now down towards the bottom, you'll see we have all of these extra clients. And um, we've got a Callisto client, Neopsa client, an RFS client, an RSTM client, and so on and so forth. And so then if I wanted to figure out what I could search for, you can again do tab complete. So type A dash INS and hit tab and it should give you a tab complete and then hit dot and hit tab again. And you get a list of all possible instruments. So for example, I could type W and there's only three W's and get waves. And that's basically uh, wind waves, the instrument. Um, now, what's different to yesterday is I've left some code in place, but basically you removed certain lines. So if you want to get that nice plot at the end, you have to figure out how to do certain things. And if we can, I'm actually not going to type stuff. I might ask people to tell me what they think I should type or what they think I should do to, to kind of uh, find um, the data. I'm not sure if that'll work, but just to try and make it so it's not me talking to you about what, what you should be doing. Maybe you guys can try it and see um, how you get on. So like yesterday, I'm going to want to search for um, some... Uh... I think that everybody is um, waiting to update their environment with radio environment. spectra. All right. I uh, did the, let me, okay, let me get some down here. If you want to do it really quickly, let's uh, So again, if it's really important that you're in your stellar environment, but if you are in your stellar environment, um, I think pip, pip install, that should work. Um, I will pop into the the radio session um, Slack. Um, if it doesn't, the other command that you might have to do um, would be um, conda conda install git. I think that doesn't look right. Um, or sorry, no, not good. Um, pip. Um, I hope that's taking a bit of time. Is that normal? Um, yeah, it should take a little while if you did it with the conda because it has to just make sure that everything, you know, you don't, um, everything works yeah. together essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, I updated with um, conda, I think it was. Yeah, so I did that in one terminal, and then I went over to another terminal and opened up the Jupyter Notebook. Mm -hmm. So should I be doing it from within the same terminal? So it, it seems that the environmental uh, variables haven't been updated in that .yml file. Um, as, as long as you're in the Stellar environment, so your prompt is starting with this, and that's where you started Jupyter from, it should work. Yeah. Um, Peter, did you do a conda activate Stellar SSW before you opened your Jupyter Notebook? 
Yeah, um, I'm, I'm sorry, you're speaking um, gobbledygook to me <laughs> at this stage, so I don't know what to say. I, I really can't keep up with all the different words. Uh, what, did, what did you say? Um, maybe Shane, can you show there how you can list your Conda environments? Um, um, I can't because I don't actually use Conda. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, this, this is one of the issues. Like, I, I, I use PyEnv instead. Uh, but basically, it should be uh, Conda n list, is it? It's Conda info minus e. <laughs> no, we are just speaking probably good. Um, yeah. Peter, I just, act, I just list the thing in the, the chat there, and it should it should activate then your. Um, yeah, um, maybe I can. The key thing is that your normal prompt should look like a normal prompt. It should have whatever you usually have, like this. And then whenever you activate an environment, which it will be different for you guys because you're using Conda, but I don't. But um, the prompt should change and should begin with the name of the environment then to let you know that you're now inside this environment file. And you have to run Jupyter from inside your environment. If you don't run it from inside your environment, um, you won't have the, the correct dependencies. Okay, um, going, yeah, could I just ask you, going back yeah. a little bit there, um, sure. so I gave up on uh, GitHub, I downloaded this file, I copied it over and overwrote all the stuff in my original tutorial, mm -hmm. which probably sounds terrible to, to you guys who know what you're doing, but um, I then tried to do the Conda in var create um, with the new environment file, mm -hmm. and I get an error that says, uh, Conda value error prefix already exists, and it uh, it gives me ooh, doo, 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 my my folder with uh, Conda environments uh, Stellar SSW. Um, so it, it, this worked perfectly well for me yesterday. I mean, it was it was relatively straightforward. Today doesn't like it at all, and this might be because I went this convoluted way of doing this. Um, yeah, um, but that sounds like is that, um, it doesn't, it like, it doesn't know that you're trying to update an environment, it tries to, it thinks that you're trying to create a new environment with the same name. Um, um well, all I'm trying to do is populate the environment that I'm already in. With yeah. uh, whatever libraries are been specified for this uh, course, yeah, for this lesson. Yeah, but how? What, what command are you using to do that? Conda, env yeah. create. Okay, yeah. Minus but, f but, and but then you, environment .yml. Yeah, but what, what's happening there is that you already have an environment called uh, Stellar SSW, um, and you're trying to recreate one. So I'm just going to pop something into into the chat. Um, oh, yeah. should I should I be doing this from outside? Of no, 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 no. It's okay. fine. But you want to update the environment, not create a new one. So, ah, I see what you mean. Okay, yeah. So, so basically, you, you're you're saying create a new environment named this, and it says no. You already have an environment named this. I can't do that. So what you want to do is is this um, like that command I just popped into the chat window of of um. So yeah, sorry. I think we're posting a lot of stuff in the Slack channel rather than in the, the Zoom chat, which is why uh, it can be a bit confusing. Um, I'm going to fire away, though, because time is taken on, and there are other people who have to talk. So um, so yeah, basically, uh, we can search for data. So similar to yesterday, um, I can do uh, a.time, and I basically know a specific time I want to look at. Um, Do this in the, I guess, the for time reasons, uh, I'm just going to kind of do this and you guys can ask me questions and hopefully you'll get it going. Uh, change this to 18. And then we can do ADA instrument dash uh, waves, for example. Um, that'll go off and query some, some waves data, hopefully. Um, sometimes it can take a while to run. And okay, similar to yesterday, um, we do a query with a time and an instrument, we get back a response and it says it's got 
two files that cover different wavelength ranges. Now, I want to search for um, a number of different instruments. So again, what we can do is similar to yesterday, I can say a.instrument waves or a.instrument as RS. And again, you can hit tab complete to get these so that you, know, you don't have to remember them. Um, a.instrument, what else do I want to look for? Um, yeah, there's one little, there's a little bug I have to fix is that the, the Callisto client is actually called eCallisto. It's just a, a typo in the software. Um, so that's, that's that. And uh, what else do you want to look for? Uh, I guess we'll look for S waves as well, or S waves as well. And uh, instrument. S -waves. S -waves. Yeah, S waves. Okay. This query is going to run off, and now hopefully we should see um, a bunch of different results from the different providers that. Um, Radio Spectre currently supports. It'll take a minute because uh, it has to go off and do uh, hit a fair few um, different websites. Jane, just while it's running there, yeah. um, who who is taking care of the repositories and where they're located? Like, are, um, is it yourself that's updating this in the background? Yeah. And are they monitored for changes? You know the way sometimes, oh, the Callisto site updates or you know the the, the data for wrist and might change its um location it's, yeah. you know i mean yeah it, it it's currently me but it's kind of kind of like some pilot there are uh, already people who like monitor the repos and if you were to create an issue saying oh you know the wrist and data is broken um they've changed the format uh, could you fix it like so, someone could come along and fix it or, or you could even try and fix it yourself but yeah it's it is um, not monitored, I would say, but it only comes about if someone tries to do something and they realize it's broken. Uh, but having said that, the, the tests, so there's a test suite in the background and it actually tries to run, run the code um, during testing. So it'll actually try and download data from the various websites. So if they go down, uh, we sh should know pretty soon, uh, or if they change formats or whatever, if that makes sense. Um, so again, I've, I've done my query with the different instruments and now just printing the results. We have results from five providers, but Waves, RSTN, Callisto, I have a whole bunch of Callistos. Uh, we've got Swaves data from the VSO client and Swaves data from the Swaves client. And this kind of comes back to what's happening yesterday is that sometimes you can get data from multiple places. Um, and now, can you just uh, swing back up there? Yeah. Mohammed, I think, had a question about the arguments to the FIDO search. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Just if you can show it again quickly, I think he's that far. Um, yeah, so I mean, I'm not sure. Was there a specific question or just? No, no, it's just that I was wondering what, what to put in the arguments. Um, oh, yeah. I, basically, I mean, what you've written there, but yeah. Yeah, that's it. I mean, so you kind of always need a time, and then there, there are many things that you could put in. But in this case, I know that I want to look for data from these specific instruments. So that's why I'm doing a.instrument waves or RSTN or eCallisto or S-Wave. So it's going to find data in this time range from any of these instruments. But honestly, you can play around with put, putting in diff different parameters later on. Um, but for the moment, I'd stick with those ones if you are trying to follow along. Um, and then you should see a query response table like this. So that's all of the different providers. Um, just like yesterday we had, uh, except it was mainly v VSO data yesterday. And it wasn't as many different clients. Um, so now let's download some data and look at it. So the exact same way as yesterday, um, we can download stuff using FIDO. Um, and maybe just to show, um, this is just a way of getting at a specific result. Um, so it's just the same table as uh, where, where, where RSTN is up here. So it's just this RSTN table. Um, it's just a, a different way of accessing it. You can use the name of the client. Um, and that'll download the results. And basically what FIDO return gives you is a list of file paths to where the data is. OK, that's fine. Now, in a really similar manner again to yesterday, um, 
spectrogram can take in a range of inputs. Um, one of the things they can take in is a list of files. Um, and so we can just feed that list of files into the spectrogram object. And what that will do is in the background, it'll create um, some spectrogram objects for us. Um, and if I look at what's, what this is, it's a list of length two, which makes sense because I had two files. So I get two spectrograms back. And um, there's even like a little text representation of what's in there. So it's telling us that it's an RSTN spectrogram from Leron, um, frequency, time coverage, and uh, one from San Vito. Uh, and then once the data is loaded, it's then just a plot call away to plot the data. Um, Yeah, mine worked there. Super handy. Um, it's so quick. Yeah. And so now you do this in, in SolarSoft and take me half a day to find a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Buried in some archive somewhere and then plot it. But this is, um, yeah, it's great. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, as I said, the reason why I'm invested in this is because I want to do radio analysis for sticks with solar orbiter and various other ground-based observatories, and I don't want to have to do, deal with those sort of problems. And so that's exactly why I built this. Um, so there's not much going on in Learmont. There's something around, uh, like maybe hey. support. Oh wait, yeah. Peter. Would you mind copying and pasting your query command with Spider that search? In? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering if I'm. It's in a bracket or something, but I just can't seem to see it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll paste it into the chat now. Um, you successfully loaded in radio spectra on the like Peter, yeah? Just wondering how people got on at that stage. I believe so. Not yet. Not yet, no. I'm a little bit behind. As I said, if you do want to follow along now, you can use the binder link. Um, and we can sort out the technical problems, you know, later on or after the comments even. Um, so now we, we looked at our RSTN spectrum, and then the idea was that I'd have you guys uh, do the same. But again, we're a little bit short on time, so I'm just going to go Where ahead. Where did you copy and paste that to? Uh, I, the, the Zoom chat. I mean, I, I can put it somewhere else if you want. Oh, I know, sorry. This thing I put in the Zoom chat again there. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I didn't see it. Sorry, no, there, there, there is a direct message. So, um, oh, okay. Um, okay, so we're going to do the same same sort of thing except for the waves data. So, uh, quite a fetch query, and then we want the waves data this time. That should work, I think. So, again, it's a very similar process. Um, Waves files. That's going to load in the waves spectrograms. Um, we can then and do the same sort of stuff. It's a list. There are two of them because there was two wave spectrograms. Uh, we can plot them or print them. Sorry. Uh, and again, it just gives us a little text representation of what's in there. Um, and then we can plot the spectrogram. Um, so this thing is just a list, so it can just access the first uh, element of the list and then call plot, and uh, because it, it is a, a spectrogram and looks like there might be something interesting happening here um, in the waves data. And yes, there is. We can see we've got a nice burst. Um, but as uh, Diana pointed out earlier on today, generally uh, our plots are are switched, so we go from high frequency to low frequency, um, so that uh, basically the bursts move up and away from the sun, uh, kind of just makes it easier to understand. Um, so we can make a, com a combined figure. Sorry, was, it, was there a question there? Or just a bit of background? I'm um, sorry, excuse, excuse me, could you please uh, back a little bit? Uh, sure. Well, yeah, yeah. But, uh, at the section of now, do the same steps, but for waves instrument? Mm hmm Here? I just want to, yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. No worries, no worries. 
Yeah, I'm about there as well. Yeah, so again, this is just a shortcut to say I want the waves responses from the query because the query has all of the data I asked for. And I don't want to download all of that and um, we'll see why. But if, if you if you input the query without an argument, it will just do everything, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. So if, if I was to get rid of this, it would just download all of the data in in that I asked, that I searched for, basically. You can also like query it like yesterday with indexing like zero, one, two. Um, if you yeah. have to do it as well, it work the same as the way it's done in some part. Shane, I guess just one thing, like, I mean, at the end of this, this tutorial, will you put up the filled in notebook just in case? I will, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I will. Um, um, okay, so yeah, we've now got our plots, hopefully, um, but we can we can make a nicer plot. Um, so here I'm just making basically a, a stack plot. So it's got uh, two rows, one column, and they have a, a common x axis. And then just like some pi maps and some pi time series with the plot command, I can tell it which which axes I want to plot it on. And um, so again, I can just execute this and uh, that's okay. Um, but really we want the weight rad one up there and rad two down there. So I can just switch the order. So I'm plotting. Um, right, maybe this is not gonna work. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, right. Because of the way um, uh, the way this works, the order of the files and um, what file gives you isn't guaranteed. So each time you execute this, you might get a different order. Um, and I'm kind of relying on a specific order. So I'm just going to uh, sort them so that they're in a specific order. And hopefully when I get down here, things will look a bit better. OK, yeah, that looks a bit better. So now we have rad two on the bottom because that's a higher frequencies, rad one on top. Um, but we might want to log the scales because that's a bit more like what is usually done. Um, and so now we've got a log scale on my frequency axis against time. And then we could also uh, zoom into the burst because the burst is obviously only from around 15 to, I don't know, maybe 80. Oh. So we can set the time. Um, and there we go. It's a nice uh, wind waves spectrogram, combined spectrogram. Um, so we've already searched for some Callisto data. Um, there's a whole rake of it though. Um, so we really need to, to subfilter. So if we do um, query Callisto. We've got a, a 402 spectrograms. That's that's way too many. I, I don't want to deal with that many. So like Laura was saying earlier on, we can um, basically uh, use indexes and we can treat the, the table as basically a, a NumPy array. So if I wanted to find maybe all of the spectrograms where the observatory is equal to, I don't know, I think Greenland might work. Um, uh, okay, yeah. So I just want to see a list of the actual observatories that I have. Um, Okay, but it's a bit annoying to read. Um, okay, so okay, obviously it needs to be a capital, um, a capital thing because I'm saying I want to know where the observatory equals this exact string. And if I do that, hopefully, okay. So now we've got a bunch of uh, observations from Greenland, um, but we can see that there's this extra field, this ID thing, and it seems to be different. Um, so maybe we need to, to filter on that as well, uh, which we can do. Um, I 
Jingle Chat Dash. Mm -hmm. Need some brackets here, sorry. Um, I think if you use Glasgow, it actually works a bit better, uh, which I might actually do because it would be easier. Um, so I'm going to switch this for Glasgow because Glasgow only has one. And there we go. Uh, we get a list of spectrogram objects from one Callisto station, the same ID. And then we can do the same process. We can download the data by telling it, I want to download the query um, Callisto stuff, but subscripted with the index that I just created, which is this subset of data. Um, and that'll go off and download all of the spectrograms. And then in a similar fashion to before, we can just pass in the downloader files um, into thing, and we get a list of best spectrogram objects. Um, and then I can just plot these. Um, ring, ring. Uh, so what I'm doing here is because there's a whole bunch of them and I'm lazy, um, I just did a little for loop. So for each spectrogram in this list call uh, plot with the axes that I defined and we get something like this. So we can see there's definitely some sort of uh, radio emission going on here. So that's, that's nice. Um, so, so far we've been looking at data that spectrogram already supports, but let's say you have data that spectrogram doesn't support, like, oh, I don't know, maybe I low fire data or the Bulgarian low fire station, whenever you guys get it operational. Um, well, you can actually load that data into a spectrogram object. And so here I'm creating some fake spectrogram data, basically an array that's 200 by 200, that's all zeros. I then set some of the values to be one. I create a time axis. So it's going to be uh, asked by times, um, like we talked about yesterday. And um, again, there's 200 of them. And then a frequency array, um, which I can actually uh, print these out. Uh, so if it did times. Is there any way of doing a verbose on some of these commands so that it tells you that I'm doing something? So, oh, yeah. or something similar. Just I, I just uh, at some points I, I I hit whatever it is control or sh shift enter. Yeah. And, and it swallows it, but then I would never get a. I'm working on that. So usually, I mean, what happens is, see the number up here. When it's busy, it, it, it should go to a star. Ah, if, that's what that means. Yeah, okay. so if, 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 if the star is there, that's telling you that it's busy doing something. And when okay, you get the number, cool. it says it's finished. Okay, I thought that was an error. No, no, yeah, it just it basically says I'm computing something or I'm, I'm busy. Um, but yeah, so sometimes it, it'll stay as a star for quite a while. Yeah. If you look at the uh, top line of the display there, just underneath the logout button, there's a Python 3 um, IPy kernel. That will, little dot there will turn black when it's running, when it's busy. Jesus. I yeah. know. It took me a while to find that one as well. <laughs> are, are you meant to be clairvoyant? <laughs> um, yeah, so th these are just two arrays. It's just an array of times that are uh, one second apart. Yeah, and frequency is just an array of quantities like we talked about yesterday in gigahertz. Um, so I can pass that in uh, and we have to give it some, some metadata. We have to tell it about what it is. And so currently at a minimum, it expects the following things, an observatory, an instrument detector, the frequencies of the data array, the times for the data array, uh, and some, some other stuff. And then we can just pass that into spectrogram uh, in a similar way to before, just the data and then the metadata. And it will create a spectrogram object. And again, we can um, uh, get a, a textual representation. It doesn't really make much sense because it's a fake, fake data. And we can plot it uh, again. Not very radio spectra-like, but um, somewhat useful. Um, sorry. And just really quickly, I'm going to show Orfe data, um, which I've misspelled there. I'm very sorry. I'll correct it before I put it up online. Um, but I've already gone to the uh, Orfe website, which is linked um, 
in the notebook and I've downloaded a FITS file just because I didn't want people to have to go and sign up and log in and do everything. Um, but we can download some ORFA data and this is a FITS file. And so you kind of have to know what the ORFA data looks like or just go in and kind of play around with the FITS file. Um, but we can extract the Stokes I and V uh, spectra. We can extract a time axis and a frequency axis. And again, it's all from uh, the FITS file. We can then construct our metadata dictionary like we did before, which I'm just going to do. And we can Sorry see. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, no. Could you please put, put the, uh, the link for the back? Yeah. Like... The, for, yeah, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, do you want me to put it into Slack or into the uh, uh, chat? Any, anywhere. No, <laughs> no problem. Okay. I'll just stick it into the into the, the chat window. Um, yes, okay. Thanks. No worries, no worries, it's fine. Um, I guess, um, yes, Jane, is it um, a plan then to add Orfe in as the other ones are in? Um, like, I mean, you can Fido search it, so to speak. Well, it's behind a weird web interface that I don't think that would be possible. If the FITS files were somewhere that we could, we could index, then yes, we could. Oh, for sure. I mean, I, I'm not sure if Nicole is on the line. But if you wanted to get in touch with whoever runs the rep the, the archive in, in Ops Paris, I'm sure they'd love to have it integrated into SumPy, you know? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, if, if we can get the data and understand how to, like, figure out, you know, what day it's from and what time it's from and stuff like that, I mean, yeah, we can definitely add it uh, for yeah. sure. Um, it's just, yeah, you have to sign up for this. If you go to this website, you have to sign up and sign in, and it's a bit... Uh, uh, it's a very nice GUI interface, but it's not so good for, for doing things programmatically. Um, yeah. But extract the data. I want to finish now. So um, you'll have all these to go back and look at and ask questions at. Extract the data, make the metadata header, and then load it into Spectrogram. We get a nice text representation. And then I can plot uh, the Spectrogram data. So there's the Stokes I. And this is the Stokes V. Um, and there might be something happening maybe here, um, possibly very uh, dim burst maybe um, but so now uh, to finish off we can make a nice combined plot and um, so similar to before I'm going to create a stack plot or like a, a series of plots that has four rows one column and uh, they're going to share a common time axis and then I can just basically reuse the plot commands I had from earlier on so I'm going to want to plot the wave spectrum uh, first and uh, two of them and then I'll plot the Callisto spectrum, and then I'll plot um, the Orfe spectrum. And then I'll basically reverse the axes so that it's in the format we expect, uh, make it a log, and uh, set, the, set the date range just to, zo to zoom in on the plot. Uh, that will take a while. Uh, and we get a plot like this. Um, Nice. So we can, yeah, basically just make a, a fairly, uh, pretty nice figure in what is not a lot of code. Uh, and it kind of follows that same idea um, with SumPy of, you know, we have containers, we have FIDO, and we have quantities, and then uh, methods to go in and, and look at the data. Um, so I am well over time, so I'm going to gonna stop. Um, That's okay, Shano. I mean, there's a lot in there, and I'm, I'm sure people were following along. Yeah, and as Laura said, I will upload like the complete tutorial with all of the commands filled in and stuff like that, um, onto the the GitHub repo, um, probably later today. Like I actually already have it on my copy, but I'll put it into the main repo. Um, Maybe and, you know, before we move on, we can ask like how do people get on? Was there success in plotting spectrograms and so on? I have mine. Great. That's good. That's very good to hear. <laughs> Someone has something. I, I got as far as the uh, RSTN and then I, I lost what there was a waves equals waves underscore files equals and I didn't know what to do. Okay. But I think I just missed that in the tutorial. Hmm. Um, I've, do, do you guys know when the, the RSTN, how, how often the RSTN data are updated? I tried something from May this year and there was nothing. Oh, I would have thought that you could get it 
I'm, yeah, me. Mm -hmm. I know there's a bunch of different sources of it. Some of it's buried in some archive in Noah, and I'm not sure where the source for Fido comes from, Shane, do you know? Uh, I do know. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, though, but I do. Uh, it's it's in the <coughs> code, though. I can dig it out real quick. Um, okay. And all I was going to say is that if you find bugs or you want a new radio source added, please make an issue on the GitHub repo. Um, yeah, because I'm happy to add things and, and make things nicer. Um, right. um, is it possible to merge or combine all these arrays into a single array altogether? Um, not, not really, because they have um, on the underlying spectral and time resolution is different but it it will soon be possible to query it in a very similar manner to to what Lo Laura showed yesterday in that you could say I want the spectrogram between these two times and these two frequencies and it would be able to intelligently give you uh, the bits from whichever spectrogram that corresponded to um, but you can combine it onto a single plot for plotting purposes. Like if, if you didn't want a stack of four plots, if you just wanted one large plot, you can do that um, currently. Um, but it's difficult to make it onto a common array without doing some regrading or, or, or something like that. But again, if that's a feature that would be useful and I can certainly see use cases for it, we, we could look at adding that. The ability to like resample all of the spectrograms onto a common grid where you could extract pixels, you know, you could just extract pixels more or less, um, for sure. Yeah, so more, I think it, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, yeah, that's okay. Um, no, I was just gonna ask, now there isn't a way, like if you download one of the RSTM files, which are really big, how, how do you choose like between two times plot? plot? Uh, the, the spectrum between two. So it's kind of like spectrogram or time series yesterday. So when you load the spectrogram, it loads all of it. And then if you want to set, if you only want to plot uh, a, a subsection, you basically plot, you set the, the limits of the x axis to be that date range. Um, at least that, that's the way it's currently done. So it really tries to be the same as other SunPy things. But, you know, it might make sense because radio spectra are different that you could pass a, a time start time end into the plot command that might make sense you know so so basically use use like truncate to um to reduce the time range yeah 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 we could do something like that for sure yeah yeah again if if that's what you'd like to see uh, please do make an issue and, and stuff and we can see about getting it getting it done because yeah, you probably want to also be able to crop in frequency so you'd probably have a it might be nice to have a dot crop and you could pass it time objects or frequency objects yeah i mean that's that that's the long-term plan yeah and to answer your question owen right now it's coming from noah ngdc archive um yeah. if you know somewhere else to get it like, like give me give me the urls and i'll plug them in yeah, I can pass on some of the ones I know at least, and they may be more up to date. Um, yeah. Um, okay. I think given the time, we can maybe move on to the next bit of the tutorial. Uh, thanks, Shane. And the next section, I guess, is, you know, in that low frequency range between like uh, 10 and 90 megahertz or 10 and 240 megahertz, where we had Callisto before, Obviously, we want to be able to plot uh, low far data. Uh, but before we can plot up low far single station data, ones from our station, I low far, we have to talk through a little bit about um, how the data is acquired. And Aoife, I think you have uh, a few slides just to show yeah. people yeah. a little bit about single station data and how you know we're going to, or what we hope to plot for single station data. Yeah, so hopefully you guys can see my screen okay? Yeah. Yeah, cool. And uh, 
Yeah, I'm going to introduce uh, working with single station data. Um, so I have been working with ILO for the last four years. And uh, during that time, I've been lucky enough to be a uh, chief observer, um, along with all of my PhD colleagues. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to share a little bit about the single station data, the different types of data, and then Pierce is going to take it from there and take you through um, a little tutorial. Um, so just starting off, um, of course, we know that LOFAR is a giant intrametric telescope array. Um, you can see here, I pointed out the core that's right in the middle of there um, in the Netherlands. Um, and the remote stations, which are all dotted around the Netherlands. And then beyond that, we have the international stations. So you can see them stretching all the way across. Um, I don't know if I have everything here at the moment, but this, this is the way it was uh, at last count. And um, we have our little station here in Burr as well. Um, so of course, uh, we can use all the, the data coming from this international array together. Um, using it to make imaging and um, make images like uh, how Pietro was explaining earlier and um, using uh, beamform data from the international array uh, similar to how um, Kira and, and Diana were touching up on. You can also use the single station data to, um, well, what we have been using it to do is to monitor the sun. Um, so if we just take a little look at a single station and what it might look like um, from up above. So this is a bird's eye view looking down. For anyone that's not familiar with a low bar station, this is what it looks like. So on the left hand side here, we have uh, the low band antennae, 96 low band antennae um, or LBAs. Um, and these go from 10 to 90 megahertz. Then on the right hand side, we have uh, these, they look like square boxes or tiles. Um, and these are the high band antennas um, or the HVA. And these observe between 120 and 240 megahertz. So you can see already that these two different types of antennae are optimized to look at two different parts of the, the low frequency range. And they literally straddle either side of the, the FM band. And then also just to uh, point out, you can see in the middle there, there's a little gray container. And that's basically the brain, the heart of the telescope. That's where all of the uh, computing is done. And um, it's where all of the signals are sent to do the processing. All right, so let's dig a little deeper. Let's have a look at one of these LBAs um, or the low band antennas here on the left hand side. So if we have a little zoom in for anyone that hasn't had a little look at one, this is what they look like. Um, really, really simple. You can see that there's this kind of heavy duty plastic pole in the middle. And this is about 1.7 meters tall, about the same height as myself. Um, and on top of this sits, uh, this little hat is actually a low noise amplifier. Um, and from this, you can see four uh, dipole antennas um, and they um, are kind of radiating outwards and attached then down um, on the ground at the four corners of this ground plane. And this, this ground plane is a, a metal grid and a, it's essentially a reflector or a mirror for radio waves. Any, any radio waves coming in can get reflected up and, uh, and observed or uh, measured by, by the antennae here. And you can see here, the, the lower part is just a simple bungee and then the upper part is the actual the actual cable um, or the actual antenna. Um, and then so the, the radio waves come in and um, they're amplified at the top in this, this amplifier. And then the, um, the voltages travel down here and um, through this, this heavy duty plastic pole um, in two coaxial cables. And um, so one being for the, the X polarization and one is for the Y polarization. And so this happens in each one of the LBAs dotted around your fields. Um, and each one of them has a, a pair of coaxial cables and these co coaxial cables travel underground and um, into the container where we said that the brain of the telescope is, is living. Um, so let's take a look at a HVA, the high band antenna. Um, and as I said before, it goes from about 110 to about 270 megahertz. 
And um, as we saw at the beginning, there are these kind of uh, large black boxes that look kind of boring when you see them in a field. Um, but if you peel back this, this heavy, heavy duty plastic tarpaulin, um, you can see what's going on inside. And um, so this here is just um, one of these tiles which has been opened up um, to look at what's going on underneath. Um, and you can see it's, it's actually all made of styrofoam. So it's a styrofoam structure um, that slots in together like a giant 3D jigsaw, uh, which makes it easy to build um, and cheap. And um, what we have here is one of these kind of dipole units. Um, and in a singular tile, you have about 16 of, you have exactly 16 of these units. Um, that we have here. And you can see actually, if you, if you look closely, um, this triangular metal here, that's the antenna. Um, it's a bow tie antenna and you can see another one here at the back. And then the other two are obscured from view here, but you can imagine they're on the either side of, uh, of this uh, styrofoam wall. Um, and so these antennas um, all connect into an amplifier here in the middle. You can kind of see that just underneath. Um, and from this, two coaxial cables, one for your X polarization, one from, for the Y polarization, just like before, travel um, and come together at a summator where the signal is summed together. So from this, you would have um, two coaxial cables coming from X, each one of these 16 units um, and all summed together for the tile. And then coming from one tile, you only have two sets of coaxial cables, one for the X polarization and one for the Y. All right, so where does all this signal end up? Well, I said in the container is the brain of the telescope. This um, is an example of one of the, the components of this. It's called a receiver unit. It's shortened down to RCU. So you, you might hear people talking about RCUs. Um, here's an example of one. You can see that it's it's a computer board with a number of chips on it, and basically what's happening here with the receiver unit is uh, it filters and digitizes the signal that's coming in from the antennae and makes it uh, usable um, for us for science. Um, so it's the first stop um, uh, for the signal on its journey from telescope from the antenna to our computers um, is this um, or CU. And so if we have a little look at the signal path, so what's going on inside of these? Um, so you can see here that we have the LBA and the HBA antennae, and they have two very distinct signal paths inside an RCU. So here, this whole schematic here is um, one RCU. So that's one of these um, computer chips from before. Um, and basically what you have here is um, a path for the signal and depending on the path of the signal you're going to have a different mode for observing. So we've heard before about interferometric imaging, about looking at spectra, but for a single station you actually have a number of different modes, another, a number of different observing modes. Um, and the different observing modes um, are dictated by what frequency you want to observe on um, and the, the uh, sampling frequency as well. So I'm going to take us step by step through the different observing modes for a single station. So we'll start here with, uh, with mode three. So mode three is the most common mode that we use for observing with low band antennas. Um, you can see here on the left hand side is um, the signal or the antenna response function. So you can see that there's a number of peaks down here at about 10 to 20 megahertz. This is a radio frequency interference. So there's a lot of interference that you'd um, experience down at these very low frequencies. Um, you can see that it has this really distinct um, shape that peaks at about 57 
megahertz. This is um, the, the resonance frequency of, of these antennas. Um, and then if we just have a little look at the signal path without going into too much detail, you can see that, um, well, actually first I should mention that if from this, um, from this diagram, you can see that there are two um, entry points for the low band antennas. And this is because um, in the original plans for low far, there was a plan for a low band high and a low band low, um, low far or low LBA antenna. And one was going to go from 10 to 30 megahertz and the other one was going to do the rest. Um, but in the end, we decided not to have that. And instead, we just have the LVAs. Um, so we only use two of the ports in um, an RCU, one for HBA and one for LBA. So you can see here that the signal travels in. Um, it goes through a high pass filter here where anything less than 10 megahertz is just simply filtered out. Um, it then gets amplified and um, goes through this band pass filter um, from 10 to 90 megahertz, amplified again, another low uh, pass filter amplified, and then goes through an analog to digital converter. Um, and it's uh, important to note that the sampling frequency here, um, as it is for most modes, is 200 megahertz. And if we just move on to mode four, so mode four is very, very similar to mode three. Um, you can see here that it is observing from 30 to about 80 or 90 megahertz, uh, depending on, yeah, 80 megahertz is probably as good as you're gonna get there. Um, and so basically mode four is used if you wanna just discard anything lower than 30 megahertz because of really bad RFI, kind of depends on the location of the single station. Some single stations or international stations have really, really poor RFI below 30 megahertz. And um, sometimes we can, in Burr, we can get down um, a little bit lower, but anything less than uh, 20 is probably just, just a mess at that stage. Um, so you can see here, it takes a very similar signal path, but instead it goes through this um, high pass filter here. So, yes. Sorry, there's a question in the chat. How oh, much is yeah. the first LNA gain of the uh, low band antenna? Sorry, could you repeat that? How much is the first uh, gain, uh, the L, uh, low nose, no, noise amplifier uh, for the low band antenna is the question. Oh, I, I okay. would not know that off the top of my head. Um, I don't know if anyone else on the call. Uh, maybe Joe? Yeah, maybe Joe. Um, unfortunately, not off the top of my head. I did this yeah. is something I did know, but uh, I don't know it anymore. <laughs> it's been a while. That, that, uh, that was something that I had asked uh, before, and I, I really never got a very good answer. But they they should, you know, we should know that number, but none of us seem to remember it. But I did ask and didn't get a, a good re response. It should be somewhere in the paper. Yeah, I can have a little look. Um... They, they give you um, station cookbooks as well for a single station and stuff. So it might be in there somewhere. Um, I think like Joe, we did know this at some point, but... Uh, um, there is somewhere, I was trying to find it there a second ago, the architectural design document for the LBAs it may actually be in there. Okay, okay. It's a, it's a very old um, document from the design phase, I guess, but uh, it won't have changed much if it's in there. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Joe. Um, sure, if you if you come across it, you can shout it in. Um, thanks for the question. So um, just taking a look then at the HBAs. Um, so you can see here on the left hand side, the response of the antenna is very, very different. Instead of this kind of single peak response, you have this kind of nearly double peak, but definitely a flatter spectra, a, a spectrum in general. Um, for mode five, you're going between 110 and about 190 megahertz. So it's not the whole um, range of the HBA. So for the for the LBA mode uh, three, you're pretty much looking at the whole, everything that an LBA can do. But for um, the HBA, you have three different modes. You have mode five, mode six, and mode seven. Um, and each of them looks at a different part of that frequency range. Um, so similar to how we had before, um, we can have a little look at the, the uh, signal path here. You can see that um, we go through a bandpass filter straight away, um, 110 to 290. 
the signal gets amplified and then we go through another bandpass filter here for mode five um, go through another uh, low pass filter and signal is amplified and then go through an analog to digital converter and again the sampling frequency is 200 megahertz um, so now as I move to mode six, um, mode six is um, 170-ish to about 230 megahertz. Um, and immediately you might be thinking, well, our sampling frequency is 200 megahertz and we want to observe 200 megahertz. So instead for mode six, mode six is the only um, mode, only observing mode that uses a different clock. It uses 160 megahertz uh, frequencies, um, sampling frequency instead of 200 megahertz. Um, it has a similar enough uh, response uh, function here um, and takes a similar signal path. The main difference is that it's using this 160 megahertz sampling frequency. And then finally, mode seven, that's, this is our last observing mode. And this goes from 210 to 270 megahertz. And you can have a look at the signal path in your own time if you're interested. I have so, a quick question, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was gonna ask why the, the responses are so different every single time, but this is it, okay. I, yeah, no, that's, well, maybe, yeah, maybe this uh, this helps here. So the, um, you can see here the responses for the, the different modes. So here we have mode three, mode five, mode six, and mode seven. Um, so you can see here mode three. Um, and the reason the, the response function for mode three and four is so different um, to five, six, and seven is because it's a totally different design of, of antenna. So obviously it's gonna have a different response function. Um, so it's, it's optimized to peak at about 60 megahertz-ish. Um, you can see here then you have mode five and mode seven, and you can see here, this is why we need a mode six because you have this, this dip in response due to the, the sampling frequency. So um, we have gone through the RCU, the receiver unit, um, and what else is inside that brain of the telescope? What else is going on in there? Um, well, we're going to take you through step by step. So here um, I've just put a box around um, the RCU. So that's everything that we've done so far. So we've gone through the bandpass filters and we've gone through an analog to digital conversion. So basically we have filtered our signal and um, we've digitized the signal. So that's where we're at. Now we're moving on to the second step which goes on to a different board. This is called the, the RSP or the Remote Station Processing Board. Um, trying to remember all the acronyms after so long. So um, you can imagine your signal is coming in here after the RCU. Hopefully you guys can see my mouse. Um, so we're finished in the receiver units and we have our digitized signal. We go into this buffer. Um, this buffer is because you have signals coming from different lengths of cable, basically. Um, so all of the signals have different um, path lengths. And so this buffer buffers the signals so that they're all kind of coming in together nicely. You then go through this uh, polyphase filter bank. Um, and what this does is it uh, divides your signal up into subbands. And this produces uh, a, dot, a data product called an SST. So what is an SST? So an SST is a file that contains subband statistics. Um, what is a subband? A subband is um, a frequency channel. It's another word for um, a frequency channel. So what we do is we channelize the, the signal coming in um, into subbands. And we normally have 512 subbands um, coming in. Um, you can see here that uh, we can calculate the frequency of the particular subband when we have the, the subband number and also the sampling frequency. Um, so these, these, this data product is often just used for sig uh, station diagnostics. That's what we would use it for, um, for making sure that all the antenna are working the way they should be, that there's no LBAs over no deer chewed on anything you know everything's working the way that we expect it um, and we would use ssts to check up on the health of the of the telescope um, 
So yeah, um, one really fun thing about low far data, um, especially single station data, is it has no header information, um, which makes it super fun to, to use. Um, so instead, we need to take information from both the, the observation script, the observing script. So you need to remember what are the commands that you, you input. Um, but you can also get uh, glean a little bit of information from the, the name of the file that you output. So you can see here, the date is the first uh, bit of information you get. The time is the second bit. The file type, so in this case, SST, subband statistics. And then the last one is the RCU number. And each one of your RCUs are numbered um, and we know what number antenna is connected to what number RCU. So you can figure out what antenna um, is giving you this, this data file. All right, moving on, let's take a look at some of the other data products coming from uh, a single station. So the next one, which is super fun, is a transient buffer board, um, or TBB is the data product. Um, and so this is really, really, really high time cadence data. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, Pierce, you'll know. I think it's, it's five nanoseconds. Thank you, five nanoseconds. Um, Pierce did a lot of work on this for his sins. Um, and you can actually take the TBB data at two different points in the signal path. You can take it before or after it gets uh, channelized into subbands. Um, so depending on yeah, how much punishment you're, you're wanting. Um, it's, it's a pretty difficult data product to work with because um, it is a high time cadence and it can only look at a really small chunk of data at a, at, at a time. Um, so we won't go into that into detail because um, I know we're stuck for time. So I'm just gonna mention that there is another data product called um, XSTs. So what are XSTs? Well, they are covariance matrices. So what you're doing is you're um, cross-correlating the signal from different antennae, um, from all the antennae, and you can produce um, an image product. So an XST can be used to make an image. Um, in ILOFAR, we often do images, um, full sky images. Um, to look at the sky um, at a particular time. It's also good for finding sources of radio frequency interference or RFI. You can uh, use XST images um, to locate where um, a little piece of RFI might be coming from. Um, so yeah, I won't go into that in any more detail and maybe that's for another time. And then the last data product that I'm gonna mention before I hand it over to Pierce is a, a BST. So this comes from when you're beam forming. Um, so um, if we move on, beams, beams, beams. Um, so LOFAR can make a, a series of beams that can point into the sky. Um, what you get left with are beamlets. So a, a BST um, is a beamlet statistic file. Um, and it will tell you about um, beamlets. So what is a beamlet? A beamlet is a, a subband in a particular direction. So a subband again is a, is a frequency channel. So you're looking at a particular frequency in a particular direction. Um, we have 488 beamlets per observation. Um, we generally leave it at that. You can change your bit mode and um, have 244 beamlets instead. Um, but the, the kind of the default is having 488 beamlets per observation. Um, uh, what's a, a really cool thing about uh, BSTs or um, these kind of uh, beam observations is you can actually divide up the beams so that you can have um, a multi-frequency observation. So multiple subbands all pointing in the same direction. And um, so you can get like a full picture of what an object looks like um, over a number of different frequencies, which is really nice. You can also look in multiple directions um, at the same subband or at the same frequency. So you can see what the whole sky or different objects in the sky might look like in the same frequency, which is also really nice. Um, and you can also do anything in between. So this is good for if you need to have a calibrator as well as a target and maybe two calibrators and you wanna divide up and have a couple of uh, beamlets looking in a, in a, a few different directions, um, which can be really useful for, for single station observations. 
again, there's no header information just to make it kind of fun. Um, but you have the information in the name of the file. You have the date, the time, the type of file, the BSD in this case, um, and the polarization. So for BSTs, you have um, a file for the, the X polarization and one for the Y polarization. And then lastly, the last thing I'm going to mention before I hand it over to you, Pierce, is uh, mode 357. So I've, I've showed you um, a number of different modes that can be used to do observations. Um, of course, um, for this workshop, we're all very concerned about the sun, right? And so one um, particular mode that we have found really, really useful in ILOFAR um, is mode 357. And this was, this was developed um, by Kyra, um, the uh, Kyra telescope. Um, and it basically combines mode 3, mode 5, and mode 7. So you're getting the best out of both worlds. You're using the, the LBAs and the HBAs. Um, I've just given details up here on how you have to divide up your, your beamlets, your subbands and your RCUs, because of course it's kind of a, it's a more involved process where you need to write the script and designate different beamlets and subbands and RCUs um, so that you can get this, this kind of frequency range. Um, but you can see here then on the left, an example of uh, the dynamic spectrum from one of these observations. And yeah, you get a lot of information. This is actually taken uh, by one of our PhD students, Jeremy, um, I, just last week, if I'm not mistaken. And you can see a number of type three bursts. Um, you can also see maybe this slowly drifting feature. Um, and you can see that it stretches from about 30 to 200 and something megahertz. Um, and the really nice thing about this observing mode is you're getting this kind of full information over a huge frequency range. Um, so you can get a better idea of what's going on. Um, so unless I have more questions, I might hand it over to you, Pierce. Yeah, in the interest of, we've only 40 minutes left. Uh, so we may get started on Pierce's tutorial, which I believe is plotting up something yes. like see here. Yeah, pretty much taking um, everything Zeke has said and putting it into practice. Yeah, so just to mention that I, I did have one at the end, but I'll post my solutions uh, instead of doing mine because Pierce is actually much more important than mine. So we may as well spend uh, the remainder of, of the time that we have. Okay, uh, and, yeah, and I'll try and keep it brief as well. So thanks so much, Aoife. That's probably the best overview of low fire single station data anyone will ever get. So really lucky for that. Um, and I'm going to, hopefully you can see everything on my screen, uh, whether that's a good thing or not will become clear. Um, so yeah, hopefully all the quirks about getting set up in Jupiter and different Python environments and things are all ironed out at this stage. So you should be able to see in day two radio session, we have BST underscore tutorial. Uh, and me, because I wrote this, has BST tutorial solutions that you won't have, but maybe we'll hop back and forth between the two. Uh, so this is going to be trying to use a bit of everything that Shane has taught us as well, and Laura using the SunPy and radio spectra and um, all that good Pythonic uh, easy to use pre-existing libraries, but with really sort of off the wall uh, low fair data. So the first thing we want to, really the first, what the overall goal of this is to basically plot an image like if our dynamic spectrum that Aoife had shown earlier, uh, mode 357 dynamic spectrum and the different things we need to go through that. Uh, but first we're gonna to need to download the data. And where does one get data for ILOFAR? And um, well, if you have a minute, you can go to data.lofar.ie and you can see here, we have all different folders with all different observations. So I can go to 2021, 07, 08, BST. Actually, I won't go to that one um, because there's probably nothing in it. I'll go to one which I know there's interesting uh, things happening. So if I go to the 9th of September, or sorry, the 2nd of September, 2017, we're going to go through all of these, and then we have got a, something like this, and it's probably really tiny uh, on your screen because it's really tiny on my screen as well. But we're going to try and plot something like this, maybe not including the uh, the goes or these swipsy things, but we're going to try and find some bursty things and plot it all up together. 
Um, so when you're downloading data from ILO for anyway, you can go through this whole click and thing and you can go and find the BST file that Eva was talking about. So you can see here, date, time, BST, and then X polarization. You can click on that, save link and download it to your computer. But fortunately, because it's a HTML link, you can also use this wget command that I have in here. So we're gonna start off our tutorial by importing everything. So we're gonna import OS, so that'll help us read different things about our files, and then things about AstroPy, Matplotlib, and NumPy. Yes, Joe. This is a, you know, a different approach to using you know, Fido, instead you're using wget. But yes, so as Shane was saying, not everything is included in Fido. Um, and at the moment, that includes ILOFAR. Uh, but hopefully, I'm going to help work on that a little bit. We'll, maybe we will be available in Fido at some point in the future. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But for the time being, we're going to just use this wget command. So yeah. if I run this cell here, uh, hopefully, you get something similar where it'll just go and you'll upload this. It'll create this data folder inside your directory. And we'll get a thing. So I can then create a new. I'll just do Here's LS just, sorry, data. just before you do that, um, yep. if you go back to the LOFAR archive there for a second, there's something that maybe people won't be aware of, or some people won't be aware of. Mm -hmm. So our files there are data files, BST uh, 00x and 00y. We also have corresponding uh, files here labeled 01x and 01y, which contain nothing. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, that's a good point. And that's a hangover from how uh, HBA um, or how BSTs are recorded in core stations because the international station has a different layout essentially to core and remote stations. Uh, I don't know if you want to say anything more specific on that, Joe. Uh, no, just that we did think LOFAR was broken when we started off with it first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so I have a I have a question. So the X and Y are the polarizations, right? And Correct, yeah. We'll just be looking at one polarization. We're just going to be looking at X for this case. Um, but by all means, you can download two and add them together and do anything you want with them, yeah. We're okay. mentioning that out of these X and Y, one can also generate, obviously, your Stokes parameters and so on. It takes a little bit more software to do that, though. Mm -hmm. um, going back to your tutorial, Pierce, it could yeah. be just me, but I get an unable to establish SSL connection. This is just a, a wget issue for me. Oh. Maybe other people have it as well. Mm. Um, I'll try again. When you try to run wget on. Yep. I get a wget command not found, even worse. <laughs> oh, and that has the exclamation mark in front of it as well. Yep. We well, all I'm to... doing is um, running. Running the thing here as it is. Have other people tried? I worked, worked for me. Worked, yeah, yeah. worked here too. Peter, maybe you need to install wget. Yeah, I was just about to say that. So yeah. Mohammed has the same problem. Maybe Paris just yeah, Windows uh, yeah. post the link to the directory and so we some yeah we download it yeah. directly from the. Uh, yeah. So I think yeah, if I put this into the Zoom chat here and you click on it, you'll be prompted to save the data. Yeah, uh, I don't have wget installed. Okay. So hopefully there's one gone into the Zoom chat and I'll put another one in the Slack. And hopefully if you click on that, you're just prompted to download data. Yeah. And where should we put it I inside uh, where the Jupyter Notebook? Yeah, just put it inside. Uh, the, in, there's a data directory inside Jupyter Notebook. So if I do LS, oops, if I do LS, so we BST tutorial and then there's a data. Um, although, yeah, this is a lot more everybody do this yourself sort of thing, but if we're running out of time, maybe we won't do that. I don't know. We'll see how we get on. Um, okay, so yeah, I'll talk a little bit about what the maybe uh, overall object, the sort of step-by-step step -step process you need for reading BST data, because it can be tricky. Uh, so once you have the da data downloaded, you need to read the BST file into memory. Uh, fortunately, there's millions of different ways in Python to do this. I use NumPy, other people use um, actually different libraries for different things. But for this tutorial, I'm going to suggest NumPy because it's just really easy. Uh, then we need to find out how many data points are there in our new, in the data that we've imported. Because as Aoife was saying, there's no header information. Literally, all we know from the file name is the time that it started at. And that's all we know. Um, so how many data points are there? And then using prior knowledge that Aoife was saying, 
um, that we have 488 beamlets and uh, we have to reshape that data. Then, um, well, yeah, I guess how many, how many was observed, what was the build, all that sort of thing. And then using, going backwards, how do we find out how long the observation was? So I think, uh, let me put in a couple of things here. So I'll copy in this first one maybe and try and explain it. Oop. So hopefully this file downloads, I'm hearing things in Slack as well, hopefully. Uh, oh yeah, okay. If there's anything urgent uh, in Slack or chat that I missed, please by all means just interrupt me. So I have downloaded this file, which is great. And I'm gonna read it in using numpy.from file. It's as simple as that, just numpy.from file. And I'm gonna do a little bit of figuring out how big the data is. So let's hit enter here. Uh, oh, because I'm silly, I'm making it download the data again. So we'll wait for that. Okay, so basically here, what we have is number of data points. So I've all loaded in the data using data 357 equals numpy from file. And I find the shape just using data.shape uh, or data.shape zero. And that's telling me that there are this many data points in that file. The next thing I want to do is find actually the file size. And the reason I want to do this is because the file size and the data points tells you what bit mode you're observing. And it tells you how many bits each individual data point is. Uh, which if you don't know anything about the data is probably the best bet. So I do os.path, get size, basically tell Python to tell me how big the file is. And it tells me that it's this big. And I should have specified that that's in bytes. Um, so if we divide one by the other, we find out that we're in bit mode number eight. Basically, we're just dividing one number by the other and it comes out as eight exactly. Which is great, telling us that we're in eight bit mode and if you remember what Aoife was saying, our default in 8-bit mode is that we have 488 beamlets. Um, so hopefully that is okay for people. I'll scroll down a little bit. So we know now that we're in 8-bit mode, but if I show you, I go data357.shape. This is telling us that the data is all in one big line. We want to change the data into a time and frequency array. So how would we do that? We need to reshape the data. Um, and again, this is done really easily in a NumPy. So I'm going to rename these the things that they're supposed to be. We know that, we know, oh yeah, to reshape. We want to reshape this thing from 1D to 2D. And a handy thing about reshape is if you know one dimension you want to reshape to be, you don't need the other one. So I want it to have 488 frequency um, channels. I can just put in minus one here and Python will figure it out. So if I do that and then do data three, actually I'll do that now. And then in a new cell, because if I run it again, it'll ruin everything. Data 357.shape. Now, all of a sudden, I'm no longer this one blah, 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 blah. I'm in a nice two dimensional uh, thing where we have time and frequency. Um, and actually, I'm just going to hop over to my solutions for a second and show you a few more things. Data 357. Oh, because I haven't run anything. That would be why that is the case. And then we do this, and then we do this, and then we do this, and then it works. Yeah. So uh, we notice now that we have time samples equal to that. And again, I'm just going to go in here, data. 357.sheep. So now we see that we have the same number of time samples and the time size, and then the same number of 488 frequency channels that we're talking about. And the next thing I've asked is a quick plot. So yeah, maybe in the interest of time, we'll not necessarily go through this. I'll just show you, and I will post the solutions afterwards, if that's OK with people. Um, because yeah, I'm sure we're all keen to actually see things. So I'm just going to sort of, what I'm doing here is doing a really, really quick plot, just to see what the data looks like, not making anything special, um, but what have I done? So this is what it looks like. It looks pretty blank at the, for the moment. So that's what this imshow command is here, just plotting the imshow. Because it's time, then frequency, we need to change it so that's frequency by time. That's what this dot t is here. Uh, it's a transpose of the data. 
And then here I am plotting the sum of the data. The reason what I'm doing here is basically summing everything across so that we only have the frequency resolution left. And this, you might remember, looks very similar to what Aoife showed us earlier about the mode 3567 uh, band pass um, plot that she showed in her presentation. So here we have the characteristic peak from mode 3, and here we have mode 5, and here we have mode 7. Maybe uh, before you move on, Pierce, just to yeah. ask people how are they getting on with yes, that. Yes, yeah, I mean, sorry, I'm very but, aware that I'm sort of running ahead a little bit, but please do, if anyone has any questions at all, so, for example, the, the dynamic spectrum, did people get that far? Please go away. Yes. I think, so. yeah, so this is sort of, this is set up that you can do it in your own time, um, if you, like in the background while I'm talking, or if you'd rather just watch me do it, I guess we can do that too. Well, can you go back up to where you plotted the 1D um, yeah. part again? The just command that, itself? The command itself, yeah. So you're just plotting, oh yeah. I basically, so. yeah. So I'm okay. summing all the data that we've loaded and I'm just summing over the zeros axis. So summing over the time, just adding all the times together. So we're only left with frequency and then taking the log of that because that's what we usually look at that one in. Um, so that's what that task for now is really complicated and not one for 15 minutes, I think. Uh, Take your time first, I mean. Yeah. It's okay. important, I think. I think so too. So I have here, actually, I might give people maybe five, 10 minutes to see, to see if they can come up with a Python function to convert subband number to frequency. Um, and if after five minutes, people are having real difficulty with it, we can just, I'll show the answer. But basically, you might remember the EFO saying to convert from frequency to subband number, we need a formula. And she showed a formula that was similar to this guy here. Basically, what we're saying is that the frequency you observe at is equal to this thing called the Nyquist zone minus one plus the subband number uh, on all times the clock frequency, the sampling frequency of LOFAR. And I have a handy dandy table here that tells you in mode 357, when you're in mode three, you're in Nyquist zone one, and these are the subbands you use. Um, and I have given sort of the hints of a a conversion thing here. So basically, you know, when you get subbands from mode 357, you know, in inverted commas, this S and this N. And I want to see if you guys can put together a Python a function to convert from one to the other. Uh, or if people don't really, really don't want to do that, tell me now and I'll just show you the answer. That's fine too. I'm gonna try. Okay. <laughs> Um, but this one, this one is a bit involved. So um, maybe I'll, yeah, just at any point, if you have no idea what's going on, just ask. Uh, so yeah, you should have all of this information as well. And uh, you can see here, I've given a sort of hint as to what you need to put in. You just need to put in the subband and the observation mode. Uh, how are people getting on with that? No, are are we having great difficulty, or is the oh, problem statement yeah, clear? Yeah, just give me a little bit of time. Okay, good stuff.
Um, excuse me, uh, could you please uh, go back to task two? I am a little bit behind. Task two, not to worry, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Maybe just re-explain that reshape there, Pierce. Yeah, so when you load in the data in the first place, it's only a one-dimensional array where it is ordered, I think, I could be wrong on this, but basically it's ordered so that you have all of the times in one frequency and then the next set of, like, it's basically one big line where it's all times and then it's the next frequency, but it's it's all just one one dimension. So what you need to do to make things easier for yourself is just to change that into a two-dimensional array uh, so that you have frequency in one axis and time on the other. And then the order that you do that in determines um, if it looks right or not. So basically, you can reshape it to be 488, comma minus 1. But if you do that, it'll be wrong because you're, um, you're reordering it in the wrong direction, if that makes sense. So basically. This is the answer here, is the, is the end uh, result of all of that. So the order that you get is 29,000 times uh, 488 frequencies then? Yeah, correct. So yeah, you can pretty much, um, I didn't show quick plot too much because we're gonna do, we're actually gonna make a radio spectra object later on that'll do the plotting for us so you don't need to worry about task three and um, in particular is that clear mohammed yes yes yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i'm now uh, at task four yeah okay Great. good stuff okay. thank you okay and then yeah just to be um very explicit about what I mean by these subbands here. That means that it's in mode three, you use subbands 54, 56, 58, 60, and every two subbands all the way up to 452, and then the same in five, and then it stops slightly earlier in seven. That's that's what I mean by subbands in this table here. Usually these subbands as well. Are specified when you set up the observation in a, you know bash script when you set it running on the station itself so in, in instead of choosing frequencies you choose subbands to observe them mm -hmm. So I know it hasn't been the most time in the world, but do people have any way towards a function to convert subbands to frequencies, or is it still totally remote? Nobody really knows what's going on. <laughs> Maybe if you start to... to, to yeah, I'll fill in, in a few blanks. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so... Hmm. Fill in a few blanks. I'll copy the entire thing. <laughs> Don't look too long at it. So what we want to do is we want to make a function that takes in a subband and an observation mode and then spits out a frequency. That's pretty much what we want to do. Um, and to do that, we need to basically put this equation into Python, uh, which isn't the most difficult thing in the world. The tricky part is knowing what microzone um, to, and subbands to use depending on what observation mode. So the way I have it set up, oops, let's just get rid of all of that. The way I have it set up here is I've given it uh, dictionaries. Why is that like? Oops. Ah, ha, ha. I have given it as a dictionary. So basically a microzone dictionary so that when you tell microzone dictionary that it's three, it'll give you one. If it's five, it'll give you two. If it's seven, it'll give you three. So basically what I've done here is that setting up something that if you tell it what mode you're in, it'll choose the microzone for you. Um, am I in the right place? I'm not, whoops, I'm here. Um, so you can see this is where this microzone thing comes into play. And then a clock dictionary, and uh, because as Aoife was saying, we can sometimes have a clock at 160 megahertz. In this case, it doesn't matter. You can just set clock equals to 200. Uh, but for now, 
and we may as well put it all together. Uh, so what this does is it'll take in a subband and SB and basically and an observation mode. And from that, it'll basically just do this equation up here. I can't get the two to fit on the same screen, which is really annoying. But frequency is the Nyquist zone that we determine uh, from our observer, observation mode, minus one, plus subband over 512, which is all of this thing in here, times the clock uh, over two. And then because we want to do things as sort of uh, similar to the rest of the AstroPi and SunPi, um, the way things are done there, we multiply it all by U dot M and H or megahertz to make it a megahertz quantity, essentially. Uh, so I can run this and hopefully it won't complain. And maybe we'll crack on. Uh, this next cell I have left in because there's no way anybody's going to want to type all of that out, <laughs> uh, essentially. So not only does mode 357 data or BST data does not have any headers, there's also no like spacing between the subbands. So you could have a subband at 20 megahertz and the next subband could be 25 megahertz, but they'd still be right next to each other in the data. So what we need to do with mode 357 data is actually space everything out and give everything its correct frequency label. And that's what this whole chunk of code or yeah, chunk does here. So, ah, and of course there's an error. Oh. Sorry, before you go into the error, can I ask why the, uh, maybe you mentioned this, but I, I didn't uh, hear, why the, why the, the um, subbands are um, separated by, by one? So it's like 54, 56, 58. It's just, it's because that is how the observing script has defined it. Um, this is the, it's what I was saying that you define subbands yourself when you're observing and the specific observing script that did the, the observation has it set up like that. Um, and it's basically it's set up so that you have a greater bandwidth, I suppose. So you could do a 54, 55, 56, but not be able to go as far uh, in each individual mode. It's, it's just to increase bandwidth. Um, and more you basically somebody. have a limited number of subbands you can operate with a 488 in 8-bit mode. So you've, you're spacing them out to cover the entire spectrum, okay. sacrificing some resolution. Okay. So if it was spaced by one, your total bandwidth instantaneous would be smaller, yeah? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So you do the, the, the picket fence thing. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what I've done wrong there. Here's a few. Okay, it works here. So let's copy this and put it into the. Oh, that's not going to be helped to you guys, though. Oh, maybe I should put it in and see what happens. Ah. Yeah, okay, sorry. So the fix there at the very top of this code block, I forgot that you have to uh, transpose the data to be frequency then time. So if in this block here, just at the very start, you put in this, it should fix everything. Um, and that's Pierce, just... Pierce, what's your, you know, your, your subband frequency function, what does that return? Is it one number or a, an array of numbers? It depends on what you put in. So if you give it in one number, it gives you a number. And if you give it an array of subbands, it gives you back an array of frequencies. So or if you put in one object mode, you get one number or a list? Oh, understood. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, it takes in an array or one number for subband. For, for ob mode, obs mode, uh, you can... I've done it where you just put in one number, but in this example here, I'm giving it in uh, an array, oh, yeah. three different arrays. No, yeah. So hang on, uh, so can you just go back up and say subbands that you're putting in is, yeah, so no, line 14. 
Line 14, sorry. Yeah, so the subbands you're defining are what? So this is, uh, I'm defining the subbands as written in the observing script so that basically this first set of subbands in mode three, the second set of subbands are mode five, and the third set are mode seven. And then I have the observing mode corresponding to that. So this is going to be three, five, and seven. So Okay, and then you are getting the frequencies out by this loop here below. Yeah, and also I've put okay. in gaps between them. I put in the blank spaces between everything as well, um, just for uh, make it look nice. Um, I suppose in the function, you could also have an option to concatenate everything inside the function, yeah? Yeah, I, like, I'm sure there's a cleverer way of doing it, to be honest, but uh, yeah. And actually, I think Shane, I think obs mode in the function has to be a single number. I think if I'm reading what I've done here correctly. Okay, no, um, uh, it, it makes sense now. Sorry, I, I thought okay. that you you just put in, yeah, it doesn't matter. I, I get it. Okay, okay, cool. And uh, yeah. Well, that, Pierce, maybe just so if people want, you could maybe copy paste the function itself. <laughs> So we're all on the same track. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. In case people didn't get that bit done. Of course, I'm very silly. Sorry, actually I can make that even nicer, can't I? Uh, sometimes I hate slap. <laughs> Okay, hopefully now that's a nice copy pasteable function for everybody who wants that. Good. Uh, and then you're going to need this data 357 equals data 357 T line in the next bit. Um, but you don't need to worry about this. All it's doing is putting the right frequency axis on the frequency. Because we don't have any header data, we need to work work through things ourselves to give it the right frequency to access. Um, I'm going to sort of ignore task five, removing the background, um, because we're, yeah, we're short on time. But just to show you what that all looks like, now, instead of just one big blob, we have three smaller blobs with gaps in between. This is the result of what we've just done. And if we, again, look at the band pass, now we see we have um, gaps between each of the modes, which is what we want. Um, I was just plotting the result of block 14, yeah? Correct, yeah. It's plotting the result of what we've just done with all of that. Okay. Um, just to make sure. Oh, okay. Mine doesn't come out. Can you show where you plotted it there? Oh, uh, sorry. This is in my solutions notebook uh, that I haven't oh, shared okay. with people. Sorry, yeah. Um, but I will share as soon as I'm finished talking, essentially. Um, background subtraction, there's a whole lot of different ways you can do, but the way I usually do it is just find a quiet time and divide everything by the, that. But we can, we'll talk a bit about that later, maybe. The important part, the actual important part of the entire thing is getting this thing to work with radio spectra. Okay. So as Shane was saying earlier, when we were using stuff with Orfe, we need to define, um, we need to define the metadata for our ILO for observation. Um, so I have here just frequency array, but I think I've actually called that frex. And I think I call this T underscore R 357. Seven. And then there's also frex. Frex. T. It'd be helpful if I called everything the same everywhere, but you know. Where did you define the T, the time? Maybe I didn't. It should be in here somewhere. It's not. Okay, cool. We'll do that bit together then. How about that? Um, let's just put it in here. So I define the time here. So I'll copy this and tell you what's going on. And I'll put it into the Slack channel as well. So we're defining the start time by parsing the string, the file name of uh, our BST357 file name. Oh, TLAM is not defined either. Okay, I'm sorry about this, guys. Maybe, you know what, I'll just stop posting it into the other one. I'll just do it in here and I'll 
post the thing. So let me go back to here. Okay, so TLAN is this, it's basically the 29,000 we found earlier. And we want to, we need to parse the file so that we know that this part of the file gives us just the time. If I just put that in here really quickly, see that tells us what the date and time it is. So then we tell astropy.time that this is our time, this is the format it's in, and it can create oops, a time object for us. So after this, if I copy that guy. Just pop. before you shoot on there, Kamen has a, an error there in the Slack. I want to oh, check. Sorry, can I broadcast? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I just think that it expects a different size array. Yeah, did you do the data 357 equals data 357? Yeah, I did. if you look at the two, I think it's just the number of frequencies is different. Right, the shape is correct. Yeah. Maybe it could be an order of operations thing as well. And depending on what order you click the things yourselves, and if you went back again, yeah, it might have changed it as well. Cool, cool. Go on. Yeah, sorry. Um where did I go? On oh, Jupiter. So this thing is now a AstroPy time object, which is really helpful. And then we just set up an array and and tr, t underscore r, r 357 is now just an array of time objects. You can see they're all there. That's great. Um, okay, so you can go away. And now we can actually go ahead. So that's sneak preview of what's going to be happening. We can go ahead and create this metadata. So ILOFAR meta, we have our observatory as ILOFAR, instrument as ILOFAR. The detector, I just called it mode 357, which is probably not as correct as we want. But anyway, putting in all the different things here. And it didn't work. Dimensions. Ooh. Oh, yeah, because I didn't put on all the other bits. Okay, that's not fine. I don't know why that's not working. Okay, I don't know why that's not working. Which bit are you on now, Pierce? I, I'm on the uh, I'm on our task six create a radio spectrum object. Yeah. Um, but okay. I'm in my solutions folder and it doesn't seem to want to work. It works for me. I think you might need to give it a minute. Okay. Um yeah, just, just give oh okay, no, that's second. Yeah. So I should say apologies to everybody, like maybe. 20 minutes before I had to talk, people came into my office to clear pigeons off the roof. So I'm not <laughs> where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> uh, because this 100% did work previously. I, mean, I, I got it to work. Okay. Uh, I have the, the, the spectrum thing. I mean, okay. I can show. Oh, yeah, my, mine shows up blank, Pierce, uh, mm -hmm. a bit like yours. But does it, as, as in the, the thing is blank, or are you an error? I get an error and it's blank. Okay, right. Yeah, what I what I had to do was um, when I printed T array three five seven, it was the wrong shape. 
It was oh only, yeah, you have to retranspose it, I think. No, 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 no. It was like as in it was the wrong size. It was only sixty six elements long when it should be two thousand eight hundred and something. Okay, maybe, maybe that was just the way that I did it. Okay, maybe I've done something silly then somewhere. I'd, I'd say yeah, just pr print out the, the, the shapes of those 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 arrays and make sure that they're the yeah. right size. Yeah. Okay. There's another transpose gone wrong somewhere. You're dead right. Flip an neck. I had this working. <laughs> so Have you run the same cell, cell twice? Or are you running the transpose twice on the data? I wonder. Am I? I might be. Yeah, running. that could well be it. Yeah. Let me try. Let's just go back from the start. And this is one of the reasons I hate Jupyter Notebooks, because the order of execution is is not like defined, and you can just yeah. You don't like that. Maybe Shane, if you have yours on the go, do you want to show it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I can show yeah, it. I'll stop um, here and figure out what's going on on my end, and then uh, yeah, because yeah. we're pretty much on four o'clock. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. So I mean, literally, I had the exact same stuff as as Pierce was showing. So I just I copied and pasted the code that he said to make the time array. I had to do something a little bit different here because I just did. But yeah, time array, it's got uh, the right size. Do the meta information um, and then create a spectrogram object. And then I plotted it and I just threw in a log norm command here just to, to, to make it show up nicely. Now, I don't know if that is what it should look like. Is it? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, what it's upside point? down compared to what I have, but yeah. Okay, well, I can fix that again. Like you, this stuff is so you can do plus dot y limb. Um, is equal to plot dot y limb reversed, I guess. Is what I'm looking for. Maybe, then, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's uh, here. I'll, yeah, it doesn't matter. I know, I know the command, but yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, right. Yeah, yeah. Here, I'll send it this thing. Uh, it takes a while to plot, and this is like one of the things we might need to work on if we want to use the low fire stuff. Is that um, it uses p color mesh in the background, and like you're plotting, what is it, two hundred eighty-eight thousand by four hundred eighty-eight little little pixels. So it takes a while sometimes. Mm -hmm. Now I'm regretting doing that. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's what it should look like, isn't it? Let's have a look. Ish. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a dope. Yeah, I know exactly what happened. <laughs> Did you figure it out? I figured it out. <laughs> what was it? I had transposed the data twice. <laughs> okay, well, I, I can stop sharing anyway. So no point in me. Stop. Chris knows what he's doing. Well, allegedly. Yeah. Yay, okay. I'm um, sorry, everybody. That's my bad. All right. Could I, um, could I ask for for just some clarification? If you can, I mean, we we've seen how it looks, but can you just briefly go through uh, that task for the the large cell? Um, the cell with all the like setting the frequencies up properly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Can yeah. You do a quick. Maybe that's that. to be honest. That's probably the most important part of all of this, or well, most tricky rather. So you should have this in, oh, sorry, can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah, we can, yeah. Okay. So this transpose here is just to make Python play with the data nicely. Uh, or maybe there's another underlying reason for it, but I, it wouldn't work if I didn't do it. So that's, that's what that is. This subbands here, I have set up here basically that in mode 357, when you're in mode three, you use these subbands and you use those subbands because they give you the biggest sort of, well, it's, it essentially goes from about 10 to about 90 megahertz when everything works out. And um, so you use these subbands and because of that, you're in micro zone one, but for each different mode you're looking at, you are, you have a different number of subbands, you're a different micro mode. So what these arrays that I'm setting up here are to basically tell, tell the function that we've written that uh, this set of arrays is going to be mode three, this set of, so, sorry, this set is going to be in mode three, this set is going to be mode five, and this set is going to be mode seven. Uh, I also set up blank arrays between mode three, five, and seven, because mode three ends at 90, 
megahertz and mode five starts at 110 megahertz you have this big blank space and if you don't okay. insert it yourself it'll just look as if it's right next to each other so you get a false sense of your frequency axis essentially is what what goes on there mm -hmm. so that's what these two these two bits are you're just setting telling it that these are the subbands we actually observe these are the subbands between them and then similarly, this is the observing mode of the subbands we observe, and this will be the observing mode of the blank subbands. So then we pipe all of that into the array. So we're doing this sort of very, well, yeah, it's a for loop inside of a list inside of a NumPy array, which is probably too fancy for what it has to be. Um, but basically, we're telling it that we want our frequency to be a frequency using our function that we defined of this particular subband in this particular mode for the subbands that we defined up here and the modes we also defined up here. Mm -hmm. And then we do the same for the, the gaps. Uh, so these are the frequencies, the actual frequencies we observe, and then these are the gaps we've observed. Mm -hmm. And then finally, it's just to concatenate all that together. So when it comes out of this, it's a list, or it's an array of lists or something silly. So this last step is just to make everything a single array, a single NumPy array. So, uh, I mean, just to, to interrupt you for a second. So this is where you define the fix here uh, and the blank fix where you uh, actually uh, tell it what the ESP, DSP is. Yes, yeah. You don't define it in advance. <clears throat> you no. use the DSBs for, uh, for defining SB. So basically use SBS to define SB. Uh, not to define mode. Yes, okay. So in this specific observation and observations, mode 357 observations, that's sort of, yeah, the subbands used for mode 357 observations are like this. But if we're looking at a completely different day, because LoFar is so versatile, you can do whatever you want with it. And that means you can set whatever subbands you want. And um, so it goes back to Aoife mentioned it, unless you know, unless you wrote the observing script and have it right next to you when you're analyzing the data, you won't know for certain what um, subband was observed, if that helps answer your question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this bit here, just to get back to it, this bit here is just concatenating all the different things you made, making one big long array of frequencies. And then finally, we need to make, put the data into that shape as well. So we make a big array of zeros, which is going to be the say, shape of the data, but now we have to include the gaps between the data, because as I was saying earlier, all the data is sort of on top of each other. So we make a big array of zeros now with the correct amount of frequencies, but the same number of time samples. Uh, and then we know that the first, we know that it's written somewhere obscurely in a piece of code on, on LoFAR that the first 200, um, the first 200 observed uh, subbands are the mode three, the second 200 are mode five, and the third, uh, whatever, whatever's left, the last 88 are mode seven. So that, what, that's what this block here is doing. Uh, it's putting the data into the shape so that you have gaps now in the data. So you'll have data for 200 blanks of like our zero values for where you don't have it, and then more data where it should be in relation to your newly created frequency array. And then finally, uh, what I do is I just create a mask here, a NumPy mask saying that if you see a zero, not even if you see a zero for these places where I've defined there to be zeros, uh, ignore it. Um, so it's a lot of stuff that you shouldn't have to worry about, but you kind of do because single station low fare data is so very flexible. It's hard to hard to come up with one thing that fits everything. Um, as, as well as that, I the the blanks are kind of an aesthetic thing as well. So I think. I mean, the, it's convoluted. You don't need to put in the blanks. But also, you don't need to put in the blanks if you're if you're to use radio spectra either, because like we plotted the like the wind rad one and rad two or the Orfe data. Like the Orfe data has separate subbands inside in it, so you could just plot each subband as a separate spectrogram on the same plot. Yeah. That way, you don't have to have a, a massive array that's taken up all of your memory. Um, okay. Yeah, so that's something we could, we could maybe work on making that. That makes sense. Quick. Yeah, that so the, 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 the bit at the end of that block there is it, it's a bit messy, you know. 
Yeah. Um, and it, the numbers look arbitrary to me. Yeah. You just, you just have to know them. It's never a satisfying answer. No, it's not. So yeah, I, I think a better way, as Shane says, is just make them separate um, inside the spectrogram object. Mm. Um, I hadn't, yeah. I So I only got on to using radio spectra, I'd say, when we were all compiling these things and putting the tutorials together. So I, I didn't think that actually it would take care of the frequency arrays for you. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't actually think of that either. It's a, it's a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I only literally just put it when, when I seen what you were doing and you explained it and um, I was like, Oh, you could do it this way. Hmm. Just um, for people who are not familiar with um, low for data, this three, five, seven mode is a script, which was written by Derek Mackay at Kyra station some years back, which we've been using because of the flexibility. Um, all of the subbands, all of the information of, as to what's where will be defined in that script. And if you are writing your own scripts for stuff like this, it's really wise to have a, an, an output log file, which tells you what's what, which is stored with your data, just so that you have some sort of semblance of a metadata with your file. So yeah, that goes back to here. We have, uh, yeah, beamctl.log. So you can see now, these are all the RCUs, RC mode. And here you can see subbands, all these different subbands that we we're talking about, where basically, and the beamlets that they correspond to. So yeah, it isn't a total unknown, uh, as Joe was saying, there is some sort of help uh, in the log files. That's not by default though. I mean, that, that's something that you, you guys like configured or like decided to save out or, or is, is it an automatic output? I think it's an automatic output of the uh, KBT. KBT script. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying, that when you, if you're writing your own scripts to do this, you need to do the same, because oh. you will get no help from the Astron files. Because mm. yeah, basically, you, you can end up with data that is useless because you have no idea what, what it is, essentially. Exactly. If you don't have the, the stuff. Yeah. Um, Maybe Pierce, in the interest of time, do you want to just quickly go through the end results of that, and then yeah. people can do it at home themselves? Yeah, and I'll I'll post on a working version of everything. Uh, so here we have uh, at long last a mode three five seven plot, and then you can find an interesting region. A predetermined interesting region is in ten to ninety megahertz, fifteen blah blah blah. There's a type two around this time, so. Yeah, I uh, don't worry too much about it, but we can, yeah, hit that, uh, hopefully. Yeah, so now, at long last, we've plotted something. So here's a type two, and what we have, all this sort of stuff up here, basically, it's going to let us click on our type two, and it'll see little red dots, and it will save these positions as an X, Y, coordinate. So I've set it up to take 10 dots, however many is that, blah, 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 just keep going. Okay, so that has saved the coordinates of X, Y. This is all, sorry, again, this is all in the solutions that I haven't shared with people because I was over ambitious. Um, so if I hit that, now we have 10 time coordinates and 10 uh, frequency coordinates. And we can save that out to an umpy.save file, uh, which would have been useful in Owen's tutorial where he goes through how to actually analyze things about solar radio bursts. Um, so I don't know, will I, I should probably stop there uh, if it makes any sense to anybody or. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's great. It's um, a great um, Jupyter notebook to have as a resource of plotting up the data. So yeah, and I guess I wouldn't have been a, a, a workshop without something going horribly wrong. <laughs> I mean, we'll, we'll upload, I'll upload the solutions for mine and Pierce will upload the solutions for you so you can run them on Binder and that they'll, that they'll work the whole way through. So, that, you know, it's. It's easy for people to figure out what's going on. It's yeah. all been a bit last minute with radio spectra, anyways, which is my fault. I know it's it's um past the hour, but I I'll, I'll just briefly go through what my one was, and it was an an effort to we were going to plot up density models of the solar atmosphere. So basically, a hydrostatic model. You know, in theory, what does it look like? and then the empirical models like New Kirk and Saito. So if people, mine is a, a pretty self-explanatory, it's not too long, but it just shows you 
electron density versus distance in the corona, what happens when you change temperature of these hydrostatic models, tells you, you know, how, how it varies. And that's for a plane parallel solution. Uh, a bit more realistic is a spherically symmetric solution of density models in the atmosphere. And then these are kind of the theory of what it should look like. And then the empirical models, uh, I haven't plotted them here. Well, one of them is empirical models, say you can plot the new Kirk model, pretty much looks like, uh, pretty much looks like this here. And then using the points from Pierce's point and click frequency and time, um, I then show, you know, you'll eventually end up with height versus time um, using a density model. And then we can, you fit that for a speed. That's, if you've done radio dynamic spectra before, um, that's kind of probably familiar work to you. If you haven't, hopefully this is laid out nicely to show you, you know, how you get a height from a frequency, how you get a speed from a drift, because it's kind of a standard thing to do for, um, for dynamic spectra. So I guess we don't really have time to go through it now. And I know it's 10 past six in Bulgaria, so you guys are probably pretty tired. It's getting to your evening. Um, I guess we can wrap up there. If there's any more questions, I mean, we can hang around and answer them. Yeah. Seems um, to be all good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, this was very interesting. Yeah. Um, again, we'll post the solutions to all of that stuff um, up right now if the solutions aren't there already. Okay. I don't double check that they work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And is there how 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 can we share the the, the presentations? I mean, I can uh, I can make um, a section on the loafer.bg, but but I guess you could also put it on the. On I, the I think page. we were thinking of putting everything on that that that, that the workshop webpage. So yeah. we'll just put links to. After each speaker, we'll get a PDF of their slides, and then we can put up the recorded sessions there as well. I think that's the plan, anyways. Um, so it'll all be in one place at least. Sure thing, yeah. For the first few, at least, maybe we could try and put the put the, the videos up and and the the talks of tomorrow, maybe sometime, yeah. um, if we get time. But um, otherwise, I think yeah, that's it for today. Um, Thank you very much, guys. It's a lot of information to process. It is, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and on that, if like I, sh I had no hesitation in contacting me or anybody, I presume, but me in particular for my stuff, like I'm always available. That's great. Thanks, Pierce. Um, one, yeah. quick, one quick question: You're gonna post the solutions on the Slack channel or? Um, I think we're going to put them in the GitHub. Um, once they're all there, we'll let everybody know. Okay, yeah, because we so people to can pull them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. So tomorrow we have our first talk at nine by Richard Harrison, and then Richard Fallows will do it's a uh, CMEs and interplant interplanetary scintillation again. Talks in the morning and a bit of a hands-on CME session in the afternoon. So I guess that's it, unless Shane, you have any more to say? Uh, no, I think I think we're good. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Pierce. That was actually very useful. I think you are muted, Yanni. Yanni is trying to say something there. Is this okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. Can you please record the sessions tomorrow? Because I'll have to miss half of the day. I have so many meetings in the afternoon. No problem. Yeah. Same as usual. Okay. Okay. Speak to everyone tomorrow. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Have a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.